transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's what we want to be. So may our hearts be in a position to hear from God's word and to work on our hearts, to be made more like him. Last time we were looking at Luke 11, we saw Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. You remember the model prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now we see Jesus running into opposition here. And the setting is his healing of a man who is mute. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Luke chapter 11, verse 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. Now, demon possession is mentioned a number of times in the scriptures. And as we know, demon possession is real. Demons are fallen angels. The devil himself is a fallen angel. He's referred to in Ezekiel 28 as the anointed cherub that covers. The guardian, anointed as the guardian cherub, different rankings of angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim. That was Lucifer in the beginning. And Revelation chapter 12 suggests that a third of the angels sided with him when he chose to rebel against God in his pride and fell. And so we have the demons in the scriptures or the uh, unclean spirits or the fallen angels. We read of a number of demon possessions in the gospels. They mess with the person's mind. Remember the demoniac from Gadara who was out of his mind and they tried to chain him together and he broke the shackles and so forth. Remember his name was Legion because there were many demons within him. They also mess with a person's body. Oftentimes we'll see Jesus casting demons out of people who are blind and who are mute and, and now they can see and they can speak. And so they mess with their bodies. Well, it's not to say that every person who's blind has a demon inside of them, but there are obviously cases like the case right before us here where you have this mute man who has this demon cast out of him and now he can speak. The issue that's taking place here is that the people are attributing the power of Jesus to Beelzebub. That's a title for Satan. Beelzebub was one of the names of the Philistine gods, the god of Ekron. It means Lord of the flies, a variant. Beelzebul means Lord of the house or Lord of the dwelling. And so we see some here attributing Jesus' power, the power of God's spirit working through Jesus, attributing that to Satan himself. In Matthew's gospel, that's referred to as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or the unpardonable sin. Have you ever heard of that before? A sin that you can commit, that a person could commit, and they would never be forgiven of that, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, it says, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Again, referred to as the unpardonable sin. And it's a scary thing, isn't it? To think that there's something that a person could do that they could never be forgiven for. I remember there was a, a young man that asked me once and he was concerned that he had committed the unpardonable sin because what is taking place here is that they are attributing, again, Jesus' power, the power of the Holy Spirit to Satan. And the friend of mine, he had, when he was younger and was going to his parents' church, would make fun of the Holy Rollers. It was a Pentecostal church, you know. And so he had felt like, because he was making fun, that he was blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and he was concerned that he could never be forgiven. And really, the simple answer is, if you're ever concerned that you've committed the unpardonable sin, you haven't committed it. <laughs> because the unpardonable sin is being closed off to Jesus, to the work of his Spirit, to what he's doing. Do, do you realize that before you became a Christian, that the Holy Spirit was working on you? Did you realize that? Now that you've become a Christian, he's working in you. But before you became a Christian, he's working on you. In John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11, Jesus said, And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit working and convicting Number one of sin, that, hey, what you're doing is wrong. And number two of righteousness, 
that, yeah, Jesus really is the way. I really do need to get my life right with God and then ultimately convicted of judgment. There's going to come a day where you're going to be accountable, where you're going to stand before God. I know that's what was happening in my life. And the Lord was working on my life, and I'm thankful for it. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit would be to be rejecting that. And can you see the logic in that? If you're rejecting the very one who can save you, how can you ever be forgiven? Because you're rejecting that forgiveness. It's not so much an act as it is a habitual state. You know, it's not an act of, oh, I rejected God once. It's a state that you're in of continuing to reject him. And if you die in that state, then obviously you have found no forgiveness, a scary place to be. The treasury of scripture knowledge says it is the calm, determined, and persevering rejection of Jesus Christ as the savior of men in opposition to all the testimony of his word and spirit. You can never be forgiven because you never seek forgiveness. No one who is afraid of having committed this sin has done so, for its very nature is to have no fear on that account. So if you were worried, you can, you can rest right now. Rest assured. So some were attributing Jesus' power to that of Satan, and this is blasphemy. It's slander. Others, as we read in verse 16, were testing him, seeking from him a sign from heaven. He's going to address the slander first, and then he's going to address the seeking of the sign. So let's read what he has to say about this. Verse 17, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Can you see the logic here? If Jesus is defeating demons by the power of Satan, then Satan is fighting against himself. It makes absolutely no sense. And a house divided, as we read, a house divided is going to fall. Can you see how bad division is? Can you see how important it is to be unified? You know, I just think applying this, apply it to our nation right now. You know, our nation is so divided, isn't it? I mean, without even picking a side, you can see that this is hurting our country. It's weakening our country. Can you imagine if we were united in our leadership of this country, how strong we would be? You know, I think about the same thing within the family unit. You've heard it said that the family that prays together stays together, right? It's really hard to pray together if you've been fighting with your wife for three days. You know what I'm saying? You have to humble yourself, don't you? So that you can get along. Unity is essential within a family and unity is essential within the family of God, within the church as well. You know, Paul spoke repeatedly about the need for unity within the church. I touched on this a little bit on Wednesday night. To the church in Corinth, you had people saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas. They were actually suing one another as well. The church in Philippi had a couple of ladies in it, Eudia and Syntyche, that weren't getting along with one another, and it was, it was you know, endangering the church. And so Paul exhorted them to be of the same mind, to simply get along to the church at Ephesus, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness 
and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is just beginning the practical side of the letter. It's kind of like the book of Romans. The first half of the letter, he's talking doctrinally. He's talking about who you are as a Christian and, and how great God is. And then he gets to chapter 4 here in the book of Ephesians, and now it's the practical side of it. And, and what he starts off with is, I beseech you, I beg you to walk, to order your manner of life after the calling that which you've been called with all lowliness. The idea is a humility and a gentleness. Long-suffering is patience. Notice bearing with one another in love. Not just, all right, I'll put up with them. I don't want to, but I'll put up with them because I'm supposed to. It's bearing with one another in love. It means learning to love the unlovable. To pray to God that he would give you a heart for the person that you're really just having a hard time with. And then he says, endeavoring to keep the unity, endeavoring to everything within your power to keep, to guard the unity <clears throat> of the Spirit, the unity that the Holy Spirit has created. You do everything within your power to guard that, to protect that. Who wants to divide us, do you think? Satan does, right? I mean, that, that is what he wants to do, is he wants to bring division. So we need to do everything we can to guard that unity that the Holy Spirit has created, and we guard that within the bond of peace. That means we work things out with one another. And as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So unity is huge. And so the logic that is brought forth here is how can Jesus be casting out demons by the power of Satan, because that kingdom then would be fighting against itself, and the kingdom would be divided. And he also says in verse 19, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? There were Jewish exorcists. So I think what he's saying, if you're going to attribute my miraculous power to that of Satan, then you've got to do the same thing for your exorcists as well. But, verse 20, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The power of God is present with you now. And that's exactly what was happening. You have Jesus, the Son of God. God in human flesh there with all of his power, being able to overcome the enemy. Verse 21, he illustrates, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. You know who the strong man is? It's Satan. Satan is the one. Satan is the one that has this tremendous spoil. What do you think that spoil is? Do you know he's referred to by Jesus as the ruler of this world? He's referred to as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians chapter 2, as the god of this age. So Satan has a tremendous amount of power and authority. The strong man, verse 21. But verse 22 when a stronger than he comes upon him. Who do you think that stronger than he is? Amen. That's Jesus, right? He's, he's infinitely stronger than Satan. You know, when you think about God and the devil, you don't ever want to think about them as equal opposites. God is all-powerful, and he's good. The devil is not all-powerful and evil. He is a created being, a fallen angel. Yes, he is evil, but he is not the equal opposite of God. God is infinitely power, uh, more powerful than Satan. Maybe we could say an equal opposite of Satan would be Michael the archangel, because both of them are high-ranking angels. Michael is good. Lucifer, Satan, has fallen. In fact, when you see them battling in Revelation chapter 12, who wins? Michael wins, that's right. So, this, so Satan is powerful. He is the strong man, but he's no match for Jesus. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. He is the image of the invisible God. He, by his very nature, is God. Jesus is more than just a good moral teacher. He's the Son of God. He came to this earth, became a man, so that he could die in our place, so that we can be forgiven. So he is the stronger than he. When a stronger than he comes, verse 22, upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He breaks him. 
he's able to overcome. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, it says of Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The principalities and, sp and powers believed to be the demonic realm. Just like there's believed to be rankings in the angelic realm of angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim, cherubim. So in the fallen realm, there's believed to be a ranking as well. The principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And he came and he disarmed them, making them a public spectacle. Notice triumphing over them in it. What do you think the it is there? How did he defeat Satan? Yes, it was at the cross. It was at the cross where he broke his power. It was at the cross where he made a way that you and I can be set free from the kingdom of darkness, didn't he? You see, you go all the way back to the beginning and you have the serpent going, has God really said that you can't eat from every tree in the garden? Oh, we'll die. Oh, you won't surely die. He deceived Eve. Adam willfully sins and they send the whole human race into the cesspool of sin. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. We're born into this world with a sin nature. So we have to make a choice, don't we? We have to make a choice to receive Christ, to be forgiven and to be able to come into his kingdom of light. And he made that all possible, that forgiveness possible when he laid his life down upon the cross. In 1 John chapter three, it says, for this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he conquered, he conquered over him at the cross. You know, Isaiah chapter 53, it's the prediction of the coming of Jesus and his sacrifice upon the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. It's his substitutionary death for us. He died in our place, in other words. When you get to the end of Isaiah 53, it ends with this verse. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He laid his life down in our place as, as a substitute. But he didn't stay dead, did he? He rose victorious from the grave. And, and it speaks here of him having the spoils now. But what do you think the spoils are? You know, Satan has come and, and, and conquered, it has deceived, and Jesus has redeemed back the spoil. It's humanity, isn't it? He was able to make a way. A long time ago, I, I, um, one of my assignments in, when I took the Isaiah class in Bible college was to do a paper on Isaiah, uh, the suffering servant, which is, starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13, and goes through Isaiah 53. And just the assignment simply was to look up all of the major words and kind of write a running commentary on it. And so as I was looking this up, as I was doing this paper, and I came to the very last verse of this, and the very last part of verse 12, he bore the sin of many. Many of you probably heard that the word sin is defined as missing the mark. Have you ever heard sin defined that way? Uh, based on an archer's game where they've got the target and when they shot, if they missed the target, if they missed the mark, they were a sinner. And so the, one of the definitions for the word sin is to miss the mark. We miss God's mark because God's mark is perfection and we all fall desperately short of that. And so it says here that he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. When you look up the word intercessors, you come to the very last definition in Strong's Concordance, it says, to reach the mark. Isn't that cool? We miss the mark, he bore the sin of many, and he made a way for us to reach the mark. Isn't that cool? Through him, I thought so too. And so Jesus, he is the stronger than he, the stronger one than Satan. And so when he casts out demons, He's doing it by the very power of God. In verse 23, he says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. How many of you know there is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus? 
You're, you're either for him or you're against him. And you might be saying, you know what? I'm not against him. I'm just not, I, I'm just not you know, a Christian. I just haven't made a decision for him. There's no neutrality. <clears throat> if you're not for him, then by default, you're against him. And again, you're born into this world as a sinner. And it's a choice that you make to receive Christ as your savior. So as Jesus is saying this, okay, we'll come back to the context here of these that are saying, oh, you're casting out demons by the ruler of the demons. And yet Jesus is casting out demons by the power of God. And if you're not for him, you're against him. Then who really is in league with Satan in this group? It's the people that are accusing him. No neutrality when it comes to Jesus. You're either for him or you are against him. And then he illustrates, I believe, with this next story. Verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. In Matthew's gospel, in this parallel passage, it says that he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it, he finds it empty. He finds it empty, swept and put in order. You know, I think about the religious leaders of Jesus' day. You know, they did a whole lot to try and make themselves as pious and religious as possible. But in reality, if there is no demon residing within and there is no Jesus that comes to fill that void, then that demon is going to come back. And as we read, he's going to bring more with him and the last state will be worse than the first. You don't want to just try and clean yourself up and not come to Jesus because you could end up in a really bad state. David Guzik writes, the heart of man has a vacuum-like nature to it. It has to be filled. If we empty our heart from evil without filling it with Jesus and his good, evil will rush in again to fill it, and sometimes worse evil than before. William Barclay writes, it's not enough to drive out evil. Good must come in. Now, in Matthew's gospel, he attributes what he's saying to the nation the nation led by the religious leaders of his day. Matthew 12, 45, he says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Again, the religious leaders who are rejecting Jesus, attributing his power to that of the devil they would be the ones that would become more and more corrupt and ultimately judgment would fall upon them. Warren Wiersbe writes, mere religion or reformation will not save. Think about that. Mere religion or reformation. I'm going to try and just do the best that I can. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. You should meet my neighbor. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Surely God would accept me into heaven. There must be regeneration. Regeneration is when you're changed from the inside. It's being born again. It's the Holy Spirit coming into your life. And that's what happens when you humble yourself and you seek God with all of your heart and he comes in and he changes your life. Again, Warren Wiersbe writes, we cannot be neutral about Jesus Christ. We're either for him or we are against him. And now it says, verse 27, and it happened as he spoke these things, that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. And he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Do you see what this well-meaning woman was doing? She was basically saying, Blessed is your mother to have such a child as you. Now, who was Jesus' mother? It was Mary, right? And this is not speaking bad against Mary at all. You know, Mary was most blessed among women. She was the one that had the privilege to be able to, to be the one that brought into the world, you know, the Son of God, the incarnation. Yet mere physical relationship isn't as important as our spiritual relationship. Do you remember the Jews? They were hanging their hat on the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. We're descendants of Abraham. And, and you remember, I think it was John the Baptist. He said, you know what? God is able to raise up from these stones descendants to Abraham. What's more important is being a spiritual descendant of Abraham, having the kind of faith that Abraham had. When Jesus' mother and his brothers were outside in Luke chapter 8, they wanted to see Jesus. And they said, hey, 
Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside and they want to come in and they want to see you. And Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Do you see the importance that he's putting, not on physical relationship, but the importance on the spiritual relationship? The blessing is on those who hear the word of God and, and do it or keep it. It's really about obedience, isn't it? It's about being a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, like James said. So we can kind of evaluate as to where we are. Are we just hearing and going, amen, yeah, I like that. Or are we going, change my heart, oh God. Speak to my heart and then making the decision to follow after him and what he wants to do. So now, having dealt with this issue of the blasphemy against Jesus, he now deals with those, as we read back again in verse 16, who were testing him and seeking from him a sign from heaven. It says in verse 29, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Now Jesus tells them that there's no sign that's going to be given except that of the prophet Jonah. In Matthew's gospel, the sign, it seems like the emphasis is on the parallel in the resurrection. As Jonah, do you remember this? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, that he would rise again from the dead. And that seemed to be the emphasis in Matthew's gospel. Here in Luke's gospel, on this occasion, it seems like the emphasis is that the Son of Man is just going to be that voice calling for repentance, like Jonah was that voice calling for the people to repent. You remember the story of Jonah, where Jonah was in Joppa, and God called him to go to the Ninevites, because they were a wicked people. They were the enemies of Israel. And Jonah knew that if he went and gave a call to repentance to the wicked Ninevites, and they repented, that God would forgive them. And Jonah didn't want that. So Jonah got on a ship, and he got as far out of there as he could, heading for Tarshish. But a great storm came up, so the sailors are crying out to their gods. Why is this storm so bad? Jonah's asleep in the boat. So they wake Jonah up, and long story short, he lets them know, I'm the problem. I'm running away from God. You want to get rid of the storm? Then throw me into the water. And so they did, and the water ceased, and God had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in there for three days and three nights, and finally, I think he came around, you know. <laughs> Seaweed is wrapped around his head, but he's praying to God. Okay, God, and, and God has the fish vomit Jonah out onto the, onto the shore, and so Jonah goes to Nineveh, and this is his, his, this is his evangelistic message right here. He entered the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's the message. Can you imagine going to, you know, Greg Laurie or some evangelist in here, and judgment's coming. That's the message. That's all he was bringing to them. But you know what? From the least of them to the greatest of them, all the way up to the king, they repented. They repented of their sin, and God spared them. And what Jesus is saying, you're not going to get any sign except that of the prophet Jonah. I'm coming through, and think about the message that Jesus came through with when you want to compare them. Jonah's just saying 40 days, and then it was going to be overthrown. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come and drink, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. He offers so much, and yet they were rejecting him. He speaks about the queen of the south. That's the queen of Sheba. That's in the days of Solomon, the son of David. Solomon was the wisest man on earth. He was the richest man on earth. And the queen of Sheba, she left. She left her land and made the long journey to come up. And just to see, is, this, is all of the fame that I'm hearing about, is it really true? And it says in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, she said to the king, 
It was the true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. She didn't believe it until she got up and she went to see if those things were actually true. And having gone, she found out it was true. And Jesus said, the queen of the south and the Ninevites, they're going to rise up in the day of judgment and they're going to condemn you because they made an effort, didn't they? The queen of the south went to see if those things about Solomon were true. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is in their midst. The Ninevites heard that message from Jonah and they repented. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is there bringing forth the message. And yet this generation rejected that message. And so they would stand condemned on the day of judgment. What about our generation? You know, what are we going to do with this right here? A admittedly, this whole passage that we're going through, it's kind of a sobering time this morning as we look at this. But, you know, that's why we, that's why we read the whole Bible, isn't it? Because we want to be confronted with things like that. So not as a church body, but as an individual. Where are you? Where are you with the Lord? You know, only you and God know that. Are you coming to this fellowship? Because, yeah, it's, it's a lot of good people here. There are a lot of great people here. It's a lot of good food here, too, you know? <laughs> is that the reason that you come? Or is it because you want to find Jesus? I tell you what, the way to find him is to open your heart and to surrender yourself to him, to give your life to him. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart, when it means everything to you, when it's more than just going, yeah, you know, I'll go, to, I'll go to church now and then or everything, when it means everything to you. And, you know, as we talk about this and we recognize how serious it is, you know, we're talking about eternity here. We're not talking about a feel-good message for, you know, a couple of weeks or something. This is eternity in front of us. Wally and Mary had the memorial service for their son yesterday. And... It was a beautiful service. Their son, Kevin, was an amazing man, an amazing son, father, husband, a great man. The Bible tells us that it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting because this is man's end. It's better to be at a memorial service because you're face to face with death. We know that we're all going to die someday. And have we prepared ourselves for that? The only way to prepare is by emptying ourselves, by humbling ourselves and asking Jesus to forgive us, to be our Lord and to be our Savior. That's all we need. And if we don't have him, we have nothing. Again, if you're not for me, you're against me. I encourage you to cry out to him. Make that decision. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness and love. We thank you for your patience with us, O oh Lord. And I pray, I pray for all who hear, O oh God, that they would come to you, that all in the sound of my voice would make a decision based on your goodness, your greatness, your love, to come to know, to come to know you, the one who loves them more than anybody could ever love them. Lord, you've given us such wonderful opportunity to have an abundant life here, but we recognize too the the important thing is that this life is a vapor and eternal.